Okay, hi everyone. Just one second. Okay. All right, so let's first begin with the quiz. So, as always, it's all true or false. It's very annoying. 15, one, two, two. Okay, so you have um, three minutes. Okay, so first announcement, assignment three is due next Monday. So you have one more week. And 
the last assignment will be also up next Monday and it will be due in two weeks from that Monday. So it will be before final project, but then not much time be between the assignment four and the final project deadline, which I think is okay because I because you are not supposed to work on all the four assignments and the final project, either two assignments and the final project or just the assignments. So should be okay for most of you, I believe. And one more thing is next Monday, I have a, a presentation. So I'll have to cancel the class. I have a talk. Uh, but I'm not sure we'll be able to cover everything because there were, um, I think, more than I thought, more, class than I had, more classes I had to miss this semester than I thought. Although um, class, the remaining classes are not, I mean, actually the next class is really important for the assignment four, but then basically the, <clears throat> after that, the remaining classes are relatively not so important um, for your assignment. So I'll see what happens, but next Monday, no class. So in the, if I think it, we have, we're out, running out of it, then I might, take a, a video of the lecture and then ask you to watch it. We'll see though. Okay, so let's first begin with the recap. Last lecture. So last lecture was the first lecture after, well, was it first? Yeah, so after we enter the paradigm of, um, well, I'll say, transfer learning or fine tuning, as opposed to supervised learning, which we devoted more than half of the semester on. So until like last, um, I mean, the, until lecture 13, we were just focusing on supervised learning or um, self-supervised learning like language model, which is straightforward in terms of uh, the, the loss that you give the model to and then how you train it, all right? And it's very convenient because supervised learning, the losses are well-defined maximum likelihood estimation or MLE. So statistically or mathematically, it's a very good property. <clears throat> but then transfer learning is a bit tricky. So what is transfer learning? Transfer learning can be defined as you learn something from another task and that you want to transfer that knowledge to the target task of your interest. So that's very common in humans. Humans can learn something in one task and um, the humans can generalize the knowledge that's learned in that task to other tasks. And for machines, that was not so obvious until we found the method called fine tuning and it has proven to be very effective in computer vision first. So how did it work? Here, you first train a classifier. Here it is image classifier. So you're, you're create, you have a model, it's called a VGG16 that's consisting of a 16 layers of CNN. That's why it's called VGG16. 16 is number of layers and uh, VGG is actually standing for v, uh, Visual geometry group. So you might wonder what that is. It's actually the research group name in the University of Oxford. So it's basically the model that was made in that group. That's why they called it VGG16. And was one of the first um, models that were widely used in image classification in the early deep learning era. And then people basically train a model, or I mean, basically just um, loaded this model that was trained on ImageNet this image classification data set. And then they just use the same parameters, same parameters for the first few layers. And, but then they still build something on top of it for, for instance, other tasks than image classification, such as detection. Detection is a bit more complicated because you now have to not only classify what each object is, but then also where that object is located. Exactly, you have to draw the bounding box. And it turns out that, well, if you just train a neural network, you know that the for maximum likelihood estimation, 
you have to randomly initialize every parameter with some tricks like uh, controlling the variance or mean of the random distribution. They usually are Gaussian, but then still it's very random initialized parameters. But then in transfer learning, instead of starting from scratch, random values, they tried using the VG16, I mean the image net train model, and it was doing much better than randomly initialized models. So that, that's where the transfer learning really showed advantage over vanilla supervised learning, which was of course very enticing for NLP people because can't we do the same thing to increase the performance of target task? Then there's a um, really good important question. So number one is, um, well, um, so how much do we want to transfer? And in fact, the um, if you're just talking about transferring the really the, the, sh the shallowest or the lowest layer, that in fact, word embedding can be considered as one of the first examples of um, transfer learning in NLP. Because um, when, when you're using word embeddings, NLP people were using embeddings that were trained in large corpus in a self-supervised way, such as word to back or glove. And basically they just um, freeze that and they use it, or sometimes they fine tune it in their target task. And they actually demonstrated pretty good performance. So that was pretty good. And good thing is that it's very easy to use because you can just replace your word, word, uh, word, word embedding, which was supposed to be randomly initialized with these pre-trained word embeddings and they just train it. So it's very, very straightforward. And the, of course, also it's good to actually note that because these are word embeddings, um, in many cases, not because they're word embeddings, sorry, but then in many cases, um, they were not fine tuned. They were froze, they're, they're frozen. And then basically only the parameters on top of the, those frozen embeddings were trained. Sometimes they work well. Sometimes fine tuning with the word embeddings work well. In general, there wasn't a single best answer. Although a, a few conjectures is that um, if you fine tune, it allows the worry vectors to be more flexible, which means um, it's usually good. But then the bad thing about fine tuning is that you will not be able to handle unseen words well because you already shifted the word embedding distribution. And then now you see unseen word um, during training, well, even though that word was actually in the initial uh, pre-trained word embedding vocab, still you have a domain shift, right? So that's a um, bad thing. And because it has a pros and cons, there is no single good answer. And word embeddings had clear limitations, which is they can only embed the words. And words meanings change a lot depending on their context. So NLP people were thinking, okay, this is not equivalent to, or as good as the image classification in vision. So what would be the image classification equivalent in NLP? Can they be simple text classification like a sentiment tree bank, sentiment sample sentiment tree bank that you have tried in your assignments? And the answer was no, actually it didn't work well. Well, there were a few, um, actually we had some idea that uh, if you train the model for a diff more difficult task and larger data, it usually um, model can be used for a, a smaller data and easier task. And in that case, then transfer learning kind of worked. So some people, including actually me, um, were actually trying training a, for instance, model on question answering and then fine tuning them on tasks like classification or a simpler question answering task and saw a lot of improvements. But then it wasn't um, universal. It didn't work well on other tasks like machine translation. And then now some people started to actually um, think that language model might be actually a good task because language model is first of all, quite difficult task. It's very hard to guess the next word right. Actually, it's impossible to get it right all the time, right? Otherwise, people will, uh, our utterances will be deterministic, but that's probably not. 
so it is hard enough. And that's when people finally uh, actually realized that, oh, language model is actually the equivalent of um, image classification and vision. So one of the first work that did this was Elmo, which trained LSTM language model bidirectionally. And then it, it basically was just um, putting this layer between the word embedding and the, the target model. So the model has to be there. So let's say we have a model for question answering. Then we basically just, if the model is probably at first layer will be word embeddings and then on top of that will be some task specific model. Then what Elmo did was that, okay, cut between the word embeddings and the task specific parts. And then instead of word embeddings, they replaced that with the, um, the outputs of these bi-directional LSTMs. So the model becomes thicker, of course, has more layers, but then now these LSTMs, the, the weights in these LSTMs are brought from the language model trained on large corpus. So they were able to see really huge improvements in various important NLP tasks. And we can think of this as a contextual word embeddings. Actually, the paper title is also contextual, contextual word representation. And that's great because you're basically contextualizing the words so that the words can be aware of their surroundings. But then after the Elmo was introduced in late 2017, actually it was um, released as a paper in um, early 2018 and one that um, called best paper I told you last time. Um, people thought, okay, do we really really need the task specific layers? And then um, people, uh, some people tried actually removing the task specific layers and then just trying to predict the output directly from the LSTMs that were trained on the language model and which actually proved to be very quite effective in some tasks. And okay, that was great. And then in the meanwhile, we also knew that um, transformer originally introduced for machine translation was slowly but surely replacing LSTMs and um, you know, attention or very um, architecturally complex models. It was pretty clear by 2018, like middle 20, uh, like early 2018, that transformer is actually, um, um, it's actually, well, it can do everything that LSTM can do. So that was why actually the next work that people tried was, okay, why not use transformer instead of LSTM? So that was GPT, the first GPT. And then another characteristic of this model was the fact that, um, it, they try to just concatenate all the inputs into one sequence and don't worry about having multiple inputs and just put some delimiters in the middle of these inputs so that at least the model will be able to distinguish them if, they, if the model needs to. And GPT-1 was um, actually pretty good work in that it would achieve so it's state of the art in many data sets, but the issue was that those data sets were not really the popular ones in NLP. So I think it didn't draw much attention it deserved, especially compared to, I would say like for instance, um, BERT, which of course um, got a lot of attention, which it deserves, but then uh, GPT-1 was not um, actually as impactful as GPT-2 or 3. And it was clear that, um, well, if there are a few things that, can, that could be improved on top of GPT-1. And the, the one thing was the scale, which also GPT-1 authors mentioned. It's, um, it was more of a conjecture, but then there was a, a very, I would say, um, general trend that larger model will do better. And then if the data is really big, which is true, right? I mean, there is like uh, almost infinite number of uh, documents on, on the web, not infinite, but a very large number of documents. So you can increase your data size without worrying about the model. I mean, no, you can increase your model size without worrying about the model being too big. So can we scale it up? And also can we actually have a larger batch size, for instance. 
And the, the, the problem back then was that most organizations didn't have the capacity or willingness to deploy multi-node training. And there wasn't one exception, I think, which was Google, which was actually just getting the TPUs in their hands since 2017. And actually the fact that Transformer was entirely consist consisted of attention is not a um, coincidence because TPU back then couldn't actually handle LSTMs. I'm not sure they can handle LSTMs these days because people actually don't use LSTMs anyways, right? But um, the first version of TPUs couldn't do any um, recurrent computation. They, they could only do, um, well, CNN or um, linear mapping and attention is all only consists of uh, linear mapping. So actually, um, there you go. I mean, the constraint, constraint actually sometimes brings innovations. So that was why Transformer was introduced. I mean, partly why. And then the um, Google was, Google had the, a lot of nodes available and they had basically this um, infrastructure and also they had the willingness to actually scale it up and that basically led to BERT in um, October 2018 which we'll, we'll talk about today. So now let's uh, let's actually end the quiz today. I'm gonna first save it. All right, so number one, question number one. True or false, the benefit of transfer learning is that its training procedure can be considered as a strict maximum like likelihood estimation where supervised learning is not. This is a clear um, false, right? Because it's actually the opposite. Well, I cannot say that supervised learning has benefit over transfer learning, but um, it is actually uh, the true correct way to say is that Supervised learning is MLE and transfer learning is not exactly MLE. Number two, true or false. When fine tuning, some portion of the model parameters are not randomly initialized, but rather copied from another model, possibly trained on a different data set. And this is true. And actually we got 95% uh, correct. So it's actually quite astonishing. I haven't, I haven't never, I never seen such number of people getting a correct, I think. Um, Although I don't think this was a relatively, um, I mean, I wasn't, I don't think this was a particularly hard, uh, easy question, but anyways, good to see that. And number three, true false, GPT uses the encoder of transformer for language modeling. And it's, it's false, right? Because GPT uses the decoder. That's why GPT can um, be trained for language model. Encoder cannot generate text. Okay, so let's go into um, lecture 15. So as I've said, I'm gonna add this. BERT is actually quite similar to GPT in many ways. Number one is that as you see, it uses the um, delimiter you see SAP, this is the delimiter that BERT uses it. Uh, well, it, it actually, it's a different one than GPT. If you see it, actually they call it delim. I'm not sure actually which token they used exactly, but then um, BERT uses SAP. So basically whether it's a single sentence input or multi-sentence input, they just concatenate all the inputs. And then they, they, they just put the SCP between these inputs just to differentiate the boundary. And then also the, it is actually also similar to GPT in that these are all transformer layers. 
But there's number one difference. Number one difference is that um, BERT uses, well, not the decoder layer, but encoder layer. So that actually gives uh, some crucial benefit and limitation. So let me talk about the um, limitation. So what is a limitation? If you don't use decoder, then you cannot generate text. That's the most important thing, difference between encoder and decoder. Because decoder in transformer, as you probably have already noticed as you do your assignment, you basically, at each time step, you have this mask attention so that uh, you don't actually look back. And then each time step, you um, apply the entire transformer rep rep repetitive repetitively so that you generate one word at a time as you apply the transformer, entire transformer. But of course, um, so that's the characteristic of decoder. But then the encoder is not able to generate text. So how can you even train language model with a model they cannot generate? Note that LSTM can generate text, you know, because LSTM is actually um, inherently decoder. And also it's actually also important to note that um, decoder compatible model is also naturally encoder. So LSTM is recurrence model. So it is actually decoder compatible model. That's why it can be used for both decoder and encoder. Um, transform decoder is also, it's a basically recurrent mo model. It basically applies um, transform re uh, repetitively. So um, that's why it is actually also, it can be also used for encoding. Although people don't do that. Why is that? Because um, the, the biggest drawback of decoder is that you have to apply this uh, many times recurrently, you cannot paralyze it. And that's exactly uh, what you want to solve with transformer, right? So the transformer's benefit is how we can actually get rid of uh, some recurrent property or the fact that you cannot paralyze it, at least on the encoder side. Although transformer decoder is clearly recurrent it's actually recurrent neural network. So when people say that transformer, oh, they actually are paralyzed, um, you know, they actually made recurrent neural network obsolete. I, I actually personally think that's actually not a correct way to say it because transformer, yes, it is true that made, it, made the encoder side RNN obsolete. So using transformer and encoder means you are not using any recurrent neural network on the encoder side. But then the decoder, unless you're creating a non-autoregressive um, sick to sick, actually, so there are some research, interesting research that try to uh, get rid of this recurrent relationship, recurrent uh, update in decoder side. But then the vanilla transformer, and in fact, even then um, the, the majority of uh, good, uh, very good decoders are actually, they have to be, um, they, looks like they have to be recurrent. So it is, it's not correct to say that transformer replaced the entire RNN. No, um, they replaced the encoder side RNNs, but then transformer decoder actually is a, can be considered as a subclass of RNN because it's actually recurrent. So coming back to the, um, the point, I mean, what, what the difference between the BERT and GPT-1 is. And that's where it comes from, right? Because BERT is encoder, so you cannot generate text. So, but then now you, if you think about it, the reason why we are training the language model is not to generate language, at least in terms of fine tuning purpose, right? Um, the purpose is actually here, we want to train a good model that can we can use for transfer learning. Then what the author thought is that, okay, why not we try to not guess the next word, but we instead erase some words in the input. Basically, this is a no noise injection, right? You're basically injecting noise into the input intentionally. And then after you have injected noise, 
your model is trained to guess what the original words were before the noises were applied. That's why people sometimes call BERT is noise, I mean, denoising autoencoder, because you basically try to remove the noise, but then it's autoencoder, right? Because you're trying to map yourself. Um, I mean, if you just try to predict the, um, the, the hidden, I mean, the, the masked words, then basically you're able to generate the entire input. I mean, it's straightforward to just copy um, non-masked words, right? So autoencoder, by the way, uh, if you have learned in the machine learning class is a model that can generate itself. Input is equal to the output. Of course, sometimes they have some bottleneck. So if they, they don't have bottleneck, it's a trivial problem. They usually have a bottleneck that um, usually very, very um, small bottleneck um, that basically it's an embedding of that sentence so that uh, we know that the embedding can generate uh, generate back the entire input. That's usually how the autoencoder works, but then in BERT, it's actually a bit different. Uh, you, have, you do not use the autoencoder to bottleneck the embedding, but to actually guess the noised or the masked words. So that's why we have this mask, mask here. So we have basically have some mask. So if, if token, we have, let's say we do have token um, five and then this token five is masked and instead of actually putting the token five into the model, they just have a special token called mask like this. So I actually wanna, yeah, so actually that's pretty convenient. I should have used that before, <laughs> like that. So then, but then we want to predict what that word is. Um, so the model is learned to predict this into token five. So that's number difference number two. So it is, oh, actually, did I forget to send you the link? Um, it's, on, it's on the website, but um, in case you need it. All right, so mask language model. And there was a, a third difference, which was um, BERT claimed to be very important, which is actually scale. Um, there was actually other differences too, but I'll soon say, I'll say um, why, why I actually put, it, put them in last. Um, so number three was the scale. So they actually increase the batch size and also number of layers and everything um, by many folds. And they say that actually that was very important actually crossing that line, crossing certain line was very important to, for the model to be very um, useful for the um, fine tuning. And in fact, it, um, if I'm, I'm remembering correctly, Bert used 64, 60, 64 TPU chips, which is equivalent to um, four pods because each pod has 16 chips. And that was uh, almost equivalent to, I will say, um, if you have used V100, which is, I think, well, these days people sometimes, use, people now start to use A100, but then if you're comparing to V100 with 32 gigabytes of um, VRAM, then that's equivalent to about 16 V100 GPUs. You can think of um, TPU V1 chip or V2 chip um, about like um, V1 chip, I think V1 chip about four V1 chip is almost equivalent to one V100. V2 chip is I think a better than that. So usually like about two V2 chip is equivalent to V100. Um, if I'm rem remembering correctly, I might be wrong. But um, you can think of it as um, it was a scale that um, if they wanted to train the BERT for large model, you needed 16 V100 GPUs. And that's um, actually, or at least 16 V100 GPUs with 32 gigabytes, or you basically need a DGX uh, station with V100. Which was actually people back then, uh, V100 was actually released in 2018 and many, very few people had V100. Um, or DGX station. So back then it was actually not um, doable easily. 
And some other difference is that they um, actually had some auxiliary task called NSP, which is next sentence prediction. But as we'll see, um, actually this turns out to be uh, not so much important. So the follow-up work removed NSP, just not as Roberta, and then they actually show that um, they can do actually better. So uh, we now know that the um, NSP doesn't have any uh, value to it. And in general, I think it is true to say that you have to train, uh, you have to, your task has to be very hard enough. NSP was too easy. It's like 95% accuracy, uh, basically predicting what the next sentence is given the choices. But then after that, um, after you have trained, pre tra uh, have a pre-trained model, then um, actually using this model for the target task was exactly the same as GPT-1. They just basically um, fine-tuned the entire model for the target task. Of course, if this classification, um, there was one interesting thing was that um, they used the CLS token, which is special token, so that they can actually um, use the embedding for sales token, and this will be some embedding, right? Um, some embedding. And then if it's classification of the entire text, then you basically map this into, um, if it's like binary classification, for instance, then you basically map this into two values, right? Um, but it's just linear mapping. So very typical linear mapping, and then try to um, formulate softmax on these two values to create your models probability distribution. If it's um, a task that involves predicting the token position, such as um, squad or um, like question answering or NER, then they actually uh, use the embedding that's corresponding to those tokens. And then again, form a softmax on top of that. So um, very straightforward actually, because um, it's very similar to how you would do that with uh, some task specific layers at the end after you use LSTMs and some layers, because even if you use LSTMs, you will probably put some layer on top of this to make uh, do your task. And uh, the only difference is that instead of using LSTMs, you just basically bring this BIRDS model and then do whatever on top of that for your target task and then just fine tune everything together. And that, that was it. So um, it's basically recapping. So what's the difference between BERT and transformer? I mean, not, I cannot say difference between BERT and transformer because they are actually doing different things. Um, it's more exact to say that what was the difference between the BERT's architecture and transformer, original transformer. So BERT uses transformers encoder, but then there were several also differences between um, these two. So what was it? Um, positional embedding. So transformer uses senior auto embedding. We, we remember that. But then BERT uses position embedding, which just, which just gives fixed embedding for each position. So it's same as, suppose that BERT's input size is, I mean, input length is 512. Then you basically have this position embedding, which is um, 512, which is the sequence length. And then you just have uh, fixed embeddings for all these. Let's say the BERT's input um, size is 1024. Position embedding, then basically you have this matrix um, and this matrix is shared across um, all tasks or I mean, it doesn't change according to the input or anything. It, it's just the embedding that's fixed. I mean, not fixed um, during training. You get, you train this embedding, but then it's a very just canonical parameters during training and during inference, it's just fixed. Um, parameters for positions. Model size was much bigger. So transformer was about um, six layers. This is um, 24 layers up to for a BERT large model. And again, I said that BERT is mask language model and the training methods were a bit different. Um, I'll not go into details, but then you will see some um, different, for instance, activation was used instead of uh, ReLU, they used JALU, which is a bit smooth version of a uh, ReLU. Remember that value is just the max between zero and um, the X. Okay, so we're gonna stop here for uh, a quick break and then actually come back to this. We're gonna cover the, uh, the rest of BERT um, at, 
445. Uh, I'll answer your question after the, um, the, um, the break. Okay, welcome back. So let's first start with the question from Changjin. So Changjin asked, 
can we just use a smaller batch size or gradient accumulation and use less GPUs? I'm curious because you emphasized that only few can access to V100 GPUs back then. Only few can train burst size models. So first of all, you're right that um, only few could train burst size models back then. So I'm talking about late 2018. So um, I was gonna actually talk about this um, in the later part of this lecture, but um, let me just actually say this now. So I'll just give you the, um, um, the, what it was like back then. So I actually remember this very clearly because so it was, I think, uh, right after the 2018 debut. So I think, you know, the debut is uh, Neighbor's annual conference. Actually, I was a neighbor back then. Um, and then I invited um, a researcher from Google for a talk at um, Neighbor. He was my friend. And he basically, uh, and then he basically was one of the, of course, the first people I met who could talk about birds. And um, the, the first thing he told me was that this actually requires a lot of computations. The reason why he said is because back then V100 was just released and even like DGX wasn't available at all. So V100 was actually out of reach for most people. So most people had to use something similar to, for instance, um, P100 or P40. And what's wrong with P40 or P100? They actually don't have half precision. And half precision was very important for um, BERT to actually work because otherwise it would have needed twice or three times the model size. I mean, three times more GPUs. And fortunately the, the first versions of TPUs were actually supporting the flow precision. So at least in terms of flow precision, it seems like um, maybe I'm not correct, but then at least to, uh, uh, from the researcher perspective, TPUs were earlier or was actually more available to the Google researchers than um, regular people having access to these um, Pascal, I mean the uh, NVIDIA GPUs. So, and the, the first reaction that, I mean, actually he was actually interning there and he was thinking about going back to Google to be more exact. And then the first thing I heard from him is that um, it's basically now the research cannot be done outside of uh, companies like Google because now it's like just, it's the war of a scaling up. Um, and we thought that actually um, back then it's really hard to scale up in companies other than big ones. Um, turns out that actually the GPUs actually um, also advanced quite fast that I think if you are now, if you now have 800, 800 GPUs, 800 GPU now has 80 gigabytes of VRAM, the most recent one. And DGX with 800 now have eight, eight GPUs of 800 with 80 gigabytes. And probably with just these eight GPUs, NVLink, you can probably, uh, Comfort, comfortably train BERT. Actually, that's what they advertise. And if you go to NVIDIA, um, they're actually the data sheet, or I mean, they're what they, when they talk about benchmarking everything, BERT is like one of the uh, core benchmarks. Um, how, how fast they can train BERT, or uh, is this model big enough to train, for instance, BERT large? And it is definitely. But um, yeah, maybe I digress, but basically coming back to this point. So it is true that back then, um, because people didn't have access to V100 and the, the, it, it's not just about the GPU RAM. P40 was 24 gigabytes RAM, but it was also not supporting half precision, which means it doesn't support full 16, only supports full 32. So you basically need like a, um, 100 P100, P40 to actually train this BERT. And what's more, if you want to actually tr uh, train such model, you have to actually communicate uh, the gradient or the basically send the, the when, when you're training it is uh, in a data parallel way. Data parallel means that uh, because your batch size is so big, you divide the batch into, um, you know, say your batch size is 500, 512. And let's say you have 100 GPUs, then you divide 512 um, size batch into, say, five si a size of five batch, and then distribute that to 100 GPUs. And then each GPU compute their uh, its own gradients, and then you accumulate them, uh, you actually aggregate them, and then compute the average as the 
final GPU, and then of course send back to the GPU for the update. This is actually called data parallel. And well, that was very not so easy because um, now not only the uh, number of GPUs is the bottleneck, but also you're now talking about, can we communicate fast enough? And because these GPUs have to be updated very quickly, and these gradients are very big. Um, for instance, BERT large has about 300 million parameters. And that means your gradient will be as big as that, at least. And what that means is 300 million um, parameters. That's like, a, for instance, a gig, what, what, let's say it's a one gigabyte. Then you have to communicate this one gigabyte gradient among GPUs really fast, uh, like sub one second. And that you cannot do that with the you know, giga, uh, ethernet cable because ethernet at, at best is like 10 gigabits, right? And 10 gigabits is still too slow because 10 gigabits is just one gigabyte per second. But you want, to, want it to be faster than that, like maybe uh, four to five gigabytes per second. And even then, you need now you're uh, observing a lot of bottlenecks here and there. So the hardware was not exactly ready for that because no one was thinking about doing multi node training. Like, why do you do that? It's a crazy thing. And um, so the funny thing is actually, if you're interested in the computer networks, um, so actually it's also personal experience that actually uh, before going to grad school, I was in Oracle. It's a company that makes um, different things. One of them, it was actually creating InfiniBand and I was actually in a team of InfiniBand, um, more on the software side though, basically, but then um, doing the InfiniBand thing. And InfiniBand is uh, basically a networking protocol that um, is faster than uh, gigabit inter ethernet. So there is a, the fastest ethernet is 10 gigabits. And the uh, InfiniBand is aiming for like 60 gigabits. So it's much faster, right? And then I personally thought that well, like who, who needs that? Like it's who, who would need to like transfer information that fast? I mean, if you're talking about downloading a movie, you will only take like a few seconds to actually download the movie with 10 gigabits anyway, ethernet cable. So why do you need like InfiniBand? And I think, um, I'm not sure people found a lot of use cases of InfiniBand since then, but apparently um, deep learning was, um, is actually single most used case actually, because yes, here you need, if it's large, model, models large, you need actually very fast um, connection or very fast transfer of data. And coming back to your um, first question, so it's actually good that you brought this up because it's actually, it's not just ask, answering a question, but it's something that I wanted to talk about in the lecture. It's very important to actually know these things to, um, you know, actually know how things happened, not just what they are now, because it's really hard to understand why that they became that way. It's, it's better to actually see the history so that you understand why they are um, like that now. And so can they, can we use small batch size? And using smaller batch size was actually not a good thing because Bert actually explicitly said that the, the biggest difference that they actually observed was the batch size. And it was important for them to make the batch size really big. And actually we'll see this um, later in the GPT-3 that that's not, also not necessarily true. So what really matters is actually batch size, model size, um, everything together. And actually, if you just try to um, pick just one that's most important, the current belief is that actually model size. But anyways, batch size is important too. So you cannot use smaller batch size. Gradient accumulation. Yes, you can do this, but then gradient accumulation is very slow. And um, well, it maybe became faster these days, but uh, we didn't have the technology back then to make this fast enough. So the problem back then was, um, I remember actually talking about what the implication of BERT is to a, a few people, a few, actually many people at uh, Naver back then, um, according to what I heard also uh, from my friends in the US. And um, basically back then using P40 GPUs, the, it seemed like, we will need like 100 P40 GPUs and train for like a two to three month 
to create one bird model. And that is like, you know, you don't even know that will succeed or not because that model might just, you know, um, not work, right? So you, have, you might have some iterations. So you, you might, might take a year. It might take like three years, four years. But, um, well, the fortunate thing is that I think, um, including Naver, I think many companies were able to catch, catch up quite fast, especially with the help of, um, um, well, V100 architecture, Volta architecture, and also later um, Emperor architecture, which was now um, even better. And also NVIDIA was very uh, proactive in, in this by, well, providing very, a lot of uh, software or library, including like, for instance, um, NVIDIA, provided NVLink, right? NVLink is a very fast connection between GPUs that's even faster in the infinite band. And, you know, it's, that's like, a, you know, the, I think very brief history. So hopefully I answered your question. Okay, another question, yeah. So do you think that GP3 can scale up more and give better performance? In other words, would breakthrough ML research only be possible for companies that can support large scale computation? Very good question. So I think um, I'll be brief about this here though, because uh, I think there are many people who don't know what GP3 is. Uh, maybe we have a time to talk about this later. And also actually, I think we'll have another discussions um, in the uh, as the final um, class, and it will be a good time for you to actually talk about this with other people too. But I will give you a short answer. So I mean, not answer actually my thoughts. So I think yes and no. So yes, in the sense that I think the the uh, GPT three or the paper right before that from OpenAI has shown that scaling up is really um, one way to lower the perplexity in a very fast manner, um, I mean, or a very uh, predictable manner. So they have a uh, quite um, very well drawn linear relationship between the, the perplexity drop and the, the um, size of model in exponential scale, not the linear scale though. So the per perplexity drops of language model drops um, well, in the much slower than the model size increases. So this has to be uh, you know, log scale to be more exact. So when the model becomes 10 times bigger then we'll see, um, for instance, every for every 10 times a uh, model gets bigger, we'll see same magnitude of perplexity decreasing. <clears throat> and then, and actually then you might wonder, so I mean, perplexity apparently has um, the um, lower bound, right? Because perplexity cannot be smaller than um, one. One is like the perfect model. So then, um, then does the scaling law really continues um, infinitely? And if it does, then, then, then hypothetically, if we can create a really large model, then we will reach zero, I mean, like perplexity of one. And I think probably not. I mean, actually, definitely not. I mean, we'll never reach perplexity of one because that's like, you know, we are basically saying that we're able to exactly guess what you're gonna say the next word. And that's always, I think, indeterministic. So we'll never reach perplexity of one, maybe um, two or three, I don't know. And if that's the case, then, well, the, I think real question is how large model do we need? And if that's the case, then is the model size something that actually um, we can afford. And here we, I'm not just saying um, in terms of a money or in terms of, a, I would say um, a certain organization or company's uh, capacity. I think in a bigger term, what if we need a computer or a model? I mean, what if we need a cluster that has as many computers as like 10 to the power of 100? 
and I think I talk about this a lot of times in this class because of uh, to let you know about the scale, 10 to the power of 100 is bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. So now we're talking about, okay, that's it, like, that's impossible, right? I mean, can you create a number of computers that's actually more than the number of atoms in the universe? Um, that's impossible. Um, I think by definition, that's impossible unless we um, have some breakthrough in the quantum computing. So we don't know, like, I mean, how large the model should be. And also of course, data is not infinite too. I mean, we're actually reaching, um, data is growing a lot, but um, the bad thing about the growing data is that I think uh, high quality data is relatively small portion too. So um, in other words, in other words, what I'm saying is that we're actually reaching the, um, the, the, the resource cap, the absolute resource cap. Um, well, I mean, there are several levels of resource cap, I think. One level is probably the, um, on the more of a money level, I mean, the financial level, whether it's country or company. But then I think uh, even uh, more or even like a much difficult, more difficult or more, almost impossible um, level that we, we, we it's, that, that's hard to uh, surpass is I think the resources on the earth in terms of energy, in terms of uh, materials we have to create the computers. And it might, I mean, if we do the math, then maybe it's impossible to actually create that many computers. So yeah, it's actually, um, when, you talk, when, when you talk about scales, then actually it becomes very not manageable very fast because it's exponential space. It's not linear space. So it's, some, it's a food for thoughts, right? And, so then how can we actually have better performance? Well, maybe we need some breakthrough in the architecture or we need some breakthrough in the um, computing. So in that case, then some, something like quantum computing. Yeah. I think that became long too. Yeah, but anyways. But good questions. Yeah, good questions, definitely. It's a really important questions these days because um, I think, yeah, I personally think it's an exciting period of time. But coming back to um, reality. So I told you that BERT position embedding um, transformer uses sinusoidal encoders, but BERT uses position embedding. So this is like something like that. And you can think of position embedding as a fixed embeddings. BERT model size, um, it's much bigger. Transformer uses six layers, um, six layers of uh, transformer. I mean, itself is transformer, right? BERT uses 24 layers. We talk about this. Um, transformer uses decoder to generate sentence, but BERT uses the encoder to and try to guess the max words. And this is like closed test, guessing the max words. BERT training is, um, instead of using sinusoidal embeddings, it just fixes length of up to 512 and batch size of up to 512 too. Um, and then uh, it needed 64 TPU chips, which is equivalent to 16 V100. And this is assuming FP16 again, so it's half precision. But Pascal architecture, it's important thing. Um, Pascal doesn't support FP16. So um, a really, really important advice. If you go to um, companies after you graduate or if you're thinking about purchasing some uh, industry grade GPUs, don't use Pascal or lower because you will not be able to operate um, half precision. And it's not just about the VRAM difference or the its flops because uh, the ability to perform FP16 is very important. And then they train the TPU, um, this TPU cluster for four days with very high network bandwidth. And that's what I mean by, you need something faster than ethernet 10 gigabits. And that's what they had in Google back then. Yeah, so I actually advise you to take a 
look at the talk slides. Um, it's very detailed. I did not try to put actually discuss this in this lecture because exactly because you can just take a look at that and probably now you, you, you are more capable of understanding what the uh, Jacob Devlin, who is the first author, is talking about in this talk. And um, actually, I didn't talk about the um, good important thing. So what did Bert actually bring? So basically, Bert achieved stability arts in every possible NLP task. And that was uh, October 2018. Um, they released this on the archive. And it was a shock. Like it was basically shock everyone because Elmo was a shock too, but then at least what the Elmo was conveying us exactly one year before the birth because Elmo was, um, I told you Elmo was, um, it was also November um, 2017. It was a shock too. Well, but then at least Elmo told you that um, oh, you have to still create your model for the task. So you, you still have to do your job. It's just that our model can boost your model, which is something that every researcher likes because like, okay, I have some contribution and then now I'll bring this and then my number goes up even more. But the BERT was different because BERT doesn't need task specific model. BERT just needs itself and just the task. It doesn't need any uh, input from the researcher in terms of model architecture. And it just basically beats everything. So, and then it, what's even more fascinating about BERT was that um, it, it can be fine tuned in a very uh, fast way compared to how models were trained back then. So if you fine tune BERT on squat, for instance, in a really good GPUs, within 30 minutes, you can achieve human performance. And that was really fascinating and also very scary for most people because they had to train like a few days and then they had to actually, of course, put a lot of time to design the model as well. But then BERT, no design, just put the data into it. 30, 30 minutes, you go to lunch and then come back. And now you're at the state of the art. And that's very fascinating and also discouraging for researchers, right? Because it's like, okay, what should I do? What should researchers do now? What are their jobs? It's, yeah, it's, it was a funny moment because I think, um, to be honest, uh, personally, I also thought that in uh, October, 2018, um, I was a researcher and I wasn't sure what I should do for my life. Yeah, actually, I think things changed since then, I think. So I can talk about that soon when I'm talking about GPT, but um, I think that was a shock that basically brought into the um, community because it feels like, you don't need to do really anything in terms of a uh, model architecture. And that would be, people thought that that was actually all they, all what the researchers were responsible for, which was not. So that was the, the, I think, misconception people had, including me. But basically this was the, 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 um, the moment that the machine learning moved from model-centric paradigm to data-centric paradigm. Because since then, it was very clear that a model is important, but then now we know that data is, well, in many cases more important because architecture can be just, everyone can use transformer. You don't need to do anything really special in many cases. I mean, of course, it's sometimes good to have uh, some task specific models, but uh, in most cases, people don't need that. And, Oh, by the way, and so they are both submitted to NACL and Elmo won the 2018 NACL best paper. NACL is NAACL. That's like one of the top tier conferences in NLP. Um, this won the 2018 best paper and Bert won NACL 2019 best paper. And what happened after BERT? So people were now trying to improve BERT in many ways. Like for instance, can we actually give different sizes, different tuning um, so that you can do better? Can we actually do um, uh, different pre-training tasks? 
can we change the architecture a bit? So one of the um, tries was, uh, can we actually um, give a, a bit different loss? Because BERT can be considered as denoised, uh, denoised autoencoder, or I mean denoising autoencoder actually. Uh, it's actually not denoised, it's denoising. Um, XLN was um, autoregressive language model instead, similar to GPT. Um, and then also, but then um, they basically did a really interesting thing, which is that um, basically they permuted the language inputs and then tried to guess the, what the original is, um, which is basically a, also a difficult task, kind of similar to denoising, but um, it, they are actually shuffling everything. So it's probably harder, right? And um, they also could replace the transformer with the transfer Excel and Excel is, um, um, it's actually for long, um, there are several differences. One is that the um, positional encoding is relative instead of absolute. So absolute, you just fit this uh, 512 and then um, some dimension into the input position. But then uh, in the relative position encoding, they instead put the position encoding when they're performing attention. So that uh, when they're performing attention, because you're performing attention between two words, then you know the distance between those two and then your embedding basically depends on the distance between them. And also um, they have a segment recur recurrence mechanism. So you can read the paper, it's, um, it's on, I think, to be honest, I think the ExcelNet itself did not replace BERT because um, the implementation is very difficult. And also the improvement was not so significant considering what the, the next model did, which is Roberta. Uh, Roberta was actually very, very um, simple in terms of what it added on top of BERT. And it's actually exactly the same architecture. So which means that you can use the Roberta um, weights for your BERT model, it's interchangeable. But then um, the biggest contribution Roberta made was that the, they thought that BERT was under-trained. So they trained BERT longer and they removed the next sentence prediction, which they thought is useless, I told you. And then uh, they trained on longer sequences and they dynamically changed the masking pattern because the BERT actually didn't do that. They actually had the fixed masking pattern, which was hardwired into the uh, inputs, input files. So it was actually an interesting thing. I don't know why they did that. Um, uh, I think the reason was that they wanted to make it fast. So um, they just basically um, did the masking offline and then didn't change at all. And more training. And then they show that this alone can achieve better accuracy in XLNet. And because Roberta was same architecture, um, they have a, you know, which is simpler than XLNet and then it's working better. So why not use Roberta? So I think um, when people use BERT, they also consider using Roberta. Although uh, it's also noting that Roberta is always not better than BERT. It seems like in some tasks, BERT is doing better. So um, when they're using BERT-like models, uh, still the standard is either using BERT or Roberta, depending on the task. Okay, I don't know why I have two same slides. Okay. Um, Okay, okay, it was not same slide. Uh, there were same slides. What the? <laughs> I think I, I made a mistake, but anyways, that's fine. Um, yeah, so I, um, I, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're gonna just, um, uh, so this lecture is up to here. So um, we just covered everything that's probably essential for you to understand how BERT works. And in the next lecture, I'm going to show you how you can implement that with a very popular library called uh, Hugging Face Transformers. And also with that, now you're also ready to run the baseline for your final project if you're actually doing final project and also you're working on this open domain QA instead of your own project. And that tutorial will be conducted by Miyoung next class. So see you on Wednesday, um, have a good Monday. Okay, talk to you later, thanks.